using the wrong words, but it's almost like a uh, day camp university or something where different kids in the neighborhood can go and mm-hmm. and research it. Uh, how long have you been doing that, and mm-hmm. what made you get started? So when I started the Association of Women in Forensic Science, that's the nonprofit side that I started in 2010. And that was mainly to provide advice to people who were working in the forensic science field and college students. Just I just wanted to serve as a liaison between the community and the forensic science community. And I just wanted to give, give that help and that support to people that needed it. And then from that I I had the Club Philly Forensics program that I started the same year for youth. And it's an after-school program. The classes are held on Saturdays. And they come in for an hour or two to a workshop. And they get to learn about the different fields in forensics from either myself or my other partners who come and teach them different aspects of forensic science. So it's not only preparing them academically, but it's giving them that exposure they need to what's happening in the streets when it comes to violence and and drugs, drug trends. What have you seen and most interested in kids? The kids, they are most interested in crime scene investigation and DNA. Those are two of the most popular fields. They're not really that interested in what I do. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so that's why I just have a variety of disciplines where uh, I I would do the forensic drug analysis portion because that's my background. I'll teach them about the the type of work that we do, the different topics, and it's, it's they're really getting a head start in the forensics field, and they're getting something that you wouldn't get unless you go to graduate school. It's, it's college level information that they're getting. And it's just good to be exposed yeah. to it and know that there are options out there. That's yes. part of the reason I do the show is because people don't realize that there are mm-hmm. different options. They and think- I'm glad that you do this show because people, a lot of people, when they think of forensics, they just think of crime scene investigators or they think of medical examiners. They don't think of us little people. Well, we're not little, but you know what I mean, yeah. where we are in the laboratory and crime scene investigators, they don't analyze evidence they collect it they preserve it they document it but when it's transported over to the crime lab we are the ones that have to sit and put in countless hours and you know just in analyzing this evidence yeah yeah, and i think people don't realize everything is a team effort it takes an army to get somebody to court definitely you know Mm -hmm. uh and uh you know it's 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 good uh, that the kids get to do that and they see different options. And when I was in school, you know, they would, you filled out these forms and you colored in the little circles and mm-hmm. they put it in. And then I remember it was a big deal when we got an Apple computer and Apple one and a counselor. We got, no matter what you entered, everybody I've talked to since and it's got together, everybody came out with you should be a park ranger. So there was like, there was no other choice. It was always park ranger. Then they got the computer and we thought there'd be other choices. It was still park ranger. I wonder how you answered the questions for them. Everybody. It was just park ranger. No matter what you put, it was park ranger. Oh, okay. So it's good they get exposed to everything else. And they had everybody, they didn't, they didn't present us with any other options. It was park ranger, something that somebody in your family Mm -hmm. did, or you just muddle along until you stumble upon something. So it's good that you've got a built in mentoring program for yes people. and kids get to see uh that there are other jobs and forensics are not the common jobs so they'll get to meet a, a firearms examiner or a forensic serologist or a dna analyst so they and then they can they'll meet them in person it's not like it's somebody that they can't talk to because because they are the ones that's teaching the classes so i, I think it's very cool and it's really needed Have you thought about, I I got an idea, maybe you did this already, but you get the people together and you go through your thing and at the end you have a crime scene set up for them and they got to solve it. I, 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 I did, um, I had a murder mystery called Murder of a Prom Queen, but it wasn't, it was a separate event. It wasn't connected to the class, but I actually was thinking of doing something like that. Maybe you can be involved with something. Yeah, like at the end of the class, mm-hmm. you know, you just put like all mini, the skills together. Like a mini together. murder mystery. Yeah. Or something like the, that. And, uh, yeah, all the different clues and everything. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you could 
you could draw from case files and yes. uh, and pick something. I had somebody on here who worked uh, Gene Supply. I forget how long, but it was thirty five years or something. The coroner's office, mm-hmm. and uh, oh my god, he had he had like a story about every block in the city. Really? Yeah. That yeah. sounds like a nice, uh, like a tour. You know how they do different tours. Yeah, he, well, his wasn't a nice tour though. He yeah, and and he 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 told the one story that I love about uh, how his experience sometimes has wrecked stuff. And I'm messing up the story, but he said that friends bought a house, and uh, he said I've been to this house before. I said, no, you haven't. No, you haven't. <laughs> he said, no, I've been here, and. Uh, he goes upstairs or whatever and pulls back the carpet. <laughs> what? And he says, see, I've been here. And it was a big stain on the, under the carpet. Oh, you my know? goodness. And he just ruined their new house for him, you know. <laughs> but it's he's been to so many places, and it's uh, and it's a different job. And he's seen it change a lot over that time, you mm-hmm. know, where it went from uh, more ha- just hands-on, uh, you know, more digital and stuff. And you've got, you've got more crime in some ways you've got different mm-hmm. crime maybe criminals are getting a little a little more crafty i don't want to say smarter but, <laughs> yeah uh, i think they're starting to um pay attention more yeah of what the consequences would be That's if they were to do it a certain way <laughs> yeah and i th- and i think that i think they do have the f- the ability maybe they don't partake of it but the ability to do more research easier Mm -hmm. a tv i think the tv shows are yeah helping them a lot and uh yeah i i see things on uh i i watch that um the shows on tv it's uh i have one in the background on the weekend sometimes late at night Mm -hmm. and uh some of it is is some of it is a borderline roadmap for how to trip up somebody that may not work in uh, a large area, but may work in a smaller town where they don't see much of something. Um, and, you know, as when we do missing person stuff, we, we've had cases and we go up towards in the Berks County, you see things different. You see different drugs and they're mixing drugs. I remember this is my information is a year or so old, but they were mixing this stuff with sawdust to fluff it Mm. and it was just messing up people's minds because we're not supposed to inject things we make in a kitchen sink and and mix with sawdust into our bodies right and that's what a lot of people are doing a lot of now like the synthetic drugs like k2 spice which is very uh it's very deadly drug and and i think the problem is is that in a in a bad economy people can make money quickly mm-hmm. uh, by doing something and they don't feel there's any consequences because they're chasing a buck. The um, How many kids have you had through your sessions? I would say in total through the events that I've done in workshops, I've came in contact with, I would say like a thousand kids okay. so far that I've been able to reach through the program. So if you, if you hit 10% of them and tickle their interest. That's good. Yes. And I do have kids that stay in touch with me. Some of them, I, I, I recruit them to be volunteers and they help me until they go to college. And then while they're in college, they keep in touch with me and let me know how they're doing. So it's, it's I think it's for me, it's just really rewarding to see them. I'm watching them grow up. Right. They start in my class and they're 12 or 13. And then next thing you know, they're graduating high school and they're in college. That's good, except for the part that makes you feel older. I know it does. Yeah. (laughs) It does make you feel older. Yeah. It does. Because then I think I have a few students that I still keep in touch with and they, they are about to graduate. And one, she's even working in the field now. So I remember when she was. And uh, maybe like a freshman or sophomore in college when I met her, and now she's working. And then they start having children, their own families, mm-hmm. and then you start feel really, really older. Yes. The, uh, uh, so you say they're interested in DNA. Is that because DNA is so well promoted now? It's it you know it's the yes. miracle thing. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I definitely think it's because of of DNA. It's it's like the golden child, they would say of forensics because 
a lot of the um, suspects that are caught caught from DNA, you know, so people are really interested in DNA. Don't they worry, though, that with the dependence on the technology and everything, that it also, if if we stare that much at, at a single thing, that we can also frame somebody, you know, uh, like I see they'll, they'll find a hair fiber. Well, it would just seem to me that it could be semi-legitimate reasons that a hair gets somewhere. Uh, uh, I, I, I remember years ago, I worked at a company and I left and the, uh, and I met up and talked with the boss afterwards a couple of years later, and he said uh, that the business was broken into. And I said, well, who who broke in? And he said, well, it was you. I said, what do you mean it was me? He said, your tool was used to break the door open, and your hat was left inside the building. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, why did you come after me? He said, because I didn't think for a second it was you. It was cl- clear and what happened was there was a co-worker there who had six months beforehand taken stuff mm-hmm. and after I left made it look like it was me but my boss didn't buy it for a second but that evidence from him having your head yeah yes you know it, but it was just too much it was too heavy handed I often wonder if you know if somebody I think it's great when people are convicted or exonerated. Or exonerated. Was, yeah, we can't forget about Yeah, and, and it exonerates people, too. But I think some. I think that no one evidence is the oracle. I think you need to have, you know, some kind of documentation, video, audio, some kind of physical evidence, maybe an eyewitness, because I think that when you get them together, they stand solid. Yes, it stands solid, and it's, it's more credible. Right, it's, and it's like... I think that if you take them separately, like eyewitnesses are probably the least reliable separately, mm. uh, and then forensic evidence. Uh, but I see, you know, I just always worry about, and we have cases where, uh, I remember a case where they had the cell phone and they figured this guy was here and they were looking in an area and, um, and they said, he's over here and we got called about it and I wanted to focus on another area. And uh, and ended up he was in the area I thought he was in, and it was well, you know, what made you have all the technology pointed over there? Right. And I, I said, this man, your instincts to man smoked four packs of cigarettes a day. He was a hundred pounds overweight. Why did he hike a mile to harm himself? Mm-hmm. And, and you think he got a sudden burst of adrenaline in his last right. minutes? Right. You know. Uh, so I guess that goes back to being more dependent, not being as dependent on technology and more on like what you just looking into, like what makes sense, like what makes the most sense, like common sense. Well, and, your gut, you, you your know, gut, always yeah, use your gut and your yes. experience to guide mm-hmm. the use of technology. Um, what do you think your, uh, before we go to the after show, what do you think that your legacy will be? Uh I think my legacy will be that I have helped so many parents and children uh, get interested in forensics. And and I would think that a lot of the information that they have learned while they have been, been in my classes have has changed their lives. That's what I think. Like, I think that um, me, you know, me connecting them with information and and giving them, um, you know, just making them feel confident, and so that they're not really intimidated by the whole by science. What's the website? Oh, the website is awifs.org. So that's a w i f as a Frank as a Sam. dot org. Awifs.org. Or you can follow me on hashtag Women in Forensics. And I also have a uh, workshop series that starts. Saturday, October 20th is called Beyond Crime Scenes and Autopsies. It's for boys and girls ages 12 to 18, and it's 10 workshops. Registration is open now on the website, ABUS.org, and they will be able to learn about crime scene investigation, firearms, serology, DNA, CPR. It's it's a lot of classes, and I um, brought together a lot of forensic, a few forensic scientists to do the classes. A couple of forensic scientists is only is also going to include digital forensics as well. So, oh okay. It's called Beyond Crime Scenes and Autopsies. It starts Saturday, October twentieth. 
Okay, that mm -hmm. sounds that sounds interesting. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you for coming, and we'll do a little bit of after show. Thank you for having me.